Good morning. Y'all ready to talk compost? Because I am. Okay. Uh, my name is Claire. Uh, I am the general manager here at Garden 17. Um, in my outside life, I am also a licensed rehabilitator for wildlife. Um, I'm also a Texas master naturalist. I spend quite a bit of time playing in soil and looking at bugs and all of the important things that they do for us. So I'm very excited about this class. Um, this class is for y'all. So keep that in mind. If you need to stand up, walk around, please don't hesitate. Um, restrooms, if you weren't here for the earlier announcement, right outside the door, directly to the right. Do what you got to do. Make yourselves comfortable. Uh, coffee, tea up here. Again, this class is for y'all. Thank you so much for being here. OK, so kind of a breakdown of what we're going to go over today. Um, first, we're going to talk about what compost actually is. Um, always great to define something that you're learning about. Um, we've got several different types of compost that we're going to talk about um, and how they kind of compare with each other. Um, the benefits of compost, which are kind of limitless. I have tried to narrow it down a little bit just to make it a little bit easier. Um, how to compost at home and what to compost at home. Um, I'm probably going to say this several times. Compost you make at home is the best compost you will ever have. Um, period. If you have the time and the patience to do your own compost, it is going to be the most active, it is going to be the most beneficial you will ever, ever have. Um, that's just because it's fresh. You know, it's hard to <laughs> describe something that's decomposed as fresh, but it's going to be the most active. It's going to be, and it's going to be the easiest. It's going to be right there at your house, so you don't have to go anywhere to get it. Okay, let's get started. So what is compost? This is a really technical topic. Um, we could spend literally days and days and days just talking about very technical definitions of compost. Um, it is a typically aerobic process. That means it needs oxygen to complete. Um, but basically, it is a biome that is taking organic material and breaking it down into a soil amendment that will provide nutrients and substrate for existing and growing plants. Um, it also provides an ideal um, environment to beneficial bacteria, to fungi, different micro and macro insects that help to break all of that down. Um, you know, you can't have healthy plants without a healthy foundation. Compost is where that all starts. Um, we can kind of see this is the cycle. Again, very technical, but um, as things decompose, nitrogen is fixed in the soil. Um, if y'all have done a lot of planting, you know that nitrogen is the one big nutrient that it's really hard for plants to produce on their own so that it has to be available in the soil. Um, composting is one of those processes that helps put that in the soil available for plant use. Um, and then we've got all of our decomposers, which are usually microorganisms that you're really only going to see with a really high powered microscope. Um, Roundworms, which are nematodes, I think that's probably the most common roundworm that we know of in gardening, at least. Um, there are billions of different species of nematodes. We talk about nematodes a lot here. Um, come on in, y'all, uh, because they are highly beneficial. Um, but again, you can't have those without having a healthy, healthy foundation for those to grow in. Also going to just throw out, and I've heard this pronounced multiple ways, um, I pronounce it detritus, I've heard it pronounced detritus, um, however you pronounce it, that is essentially dead organic material, so think of like a tree leaf that has fallen off. There's really no nutrients left in that leaf. The plant has exhausted those, so it is now considered dead organic material. Um, that is what the detrius is. Um, it's ingested by those microorganisms, and then that is in turn converted into organic material, which makes up compost. Um, 
if you've ever walked, you know, gone hiking or anything, you see evidence of this everywhere on the forest floor, stuff like that. Um, but it does have a very fancy pants name to it. Um, and then we have our food web. So, so much is happening in that compost. There is just so much happening. Um, bacteria and microorganisms are more healthy. I think the most, what most people are familiar with are going to be earthworm castings. It's essentially worm poop. Um, highly beneficial. It's going to help add structure to your soil. It's going to help add drainage. It's also going to provide some of that calcium, some of those more micronutrients that are really hard for plants to come by. Um, in the soil without amending, um, this is really going to help. If you have a healthy earthworm population, you've already got castings in your soil because they just naturally as they grow and develop they're going to kind of cast things off um, that's just part of bugs um, but it also has a lot of poop this is the best poop you will ever have um, <laughs> so if you haven't experimented with earthworm castings before highly recommend it um, they don't do anything but good things and I like to support worms Okay, so we've got several different kinds of compost. Um, often you are not going, let me rephrase that. More often than not, these will be combined in some ratio. A lot of times we're gonna see both leaf mold and fungal together. Um, I often see fungal and manure compost together. Um, but individually they do have very important roles to play so leaf mold compost again we talked about the dead organic material it's not going to add a lot of nutrients there are little to no nutrients left in those leaves what it does do is it adds structure to the soil um, think if you've ever raked in a pile of leaves and just kind of covered it with soil that's going to take a while to break down it's going to add some grit to your soil it's just going to provide a better structure of soil for you um, it also tends to um, be a more bacterial uh, microflora than um, than anything else and that's just because the bacteria are what are actively breaking down that leaf. Um, compared to fungal, uh, fungal compost, I find to be one of the most active composts. Um, fungus, that's a whole nother talk. Um, <laughs> that's another subject that we could literally spend days on and barely scratch the surface. Um, we can kind of see this decomposition happening here. Not only is fungus decomposing organic material, it's webbing of organism, like so it's all one organism. As it spreads throughout the soil, that is transferring moisture, that is transferring uh, nutrients throughout the soil. It's also aerating to a certain extent. It's kind of making tunnels through that substrate to make those nutrients more available to plant roots. Um, I tend to use fungal more than anything. Uh, I've had a lot of luck with it and it's kind of what I started out with and I will say right now I am a brand shopper so once I find something I really like I kind of stick with it. I've had nothing but success with fungal compost. Um, and it's going to enhance that nitrogen fixation um, which so has anyone ever grown beans specifically? Have you had to supplement quite a bit with nitrogen? I don't really do that. Gotcha. So um, beans are interesting. They need a lot of nitrogen, but they also kind of act as nitrogen fixers to make it available for other uh, plants, but that does come at a cost to them. Um, so nitrogen fixation in the soil is really, really important. Um, Again, it's just one of those nutrients that the plant cannot produce by itself. Um, there's certain amino acids that we have to take supplements for because our body can't produce them ourselves. Kind of the sim similar thing for plants. Um, and then we have manure compost. More poop. 
<laughs> but so manure does a lot of really unique things that you're really not going to get with a plant-based compost. Um, it does have to be treated a little differently because it is poop. Um, so often when you see a compost that has manure in it, that is a pre-composted manure that is added to it. There's lots of regulations. It has to be heated to a certain temperature to kill any harmful pathogens that may be there. But it can also help with weed control. Um, it can really put weed seeds in their place, eliminate the issue for that completely. It can also act as kind of an anti-parasitic in the soil. It doesn't have effect on those beneficial guys, but it may have an effect on the things that could be damaging your plants or potentially hurting that microbiome that's happening underneath the, the surface of the soil. Um, and it adds tons of structure to that soil. Um, it's really gonna be a lot of addition to it. Love it, love it. And if you are ever buying compost that has manure in it, it should smell a little poopy, but if it is like overwhelming, I would maybe find a different brand. Um, it really, kind of like fresh fish, like it should smell like ocean. It shouldn't smell like fish. Manure compost should smell earthy and not, again, not poopy, just really earthy. Um, so if you're opening a bag that's extra super stinky and there's no other explanation for it, um, come talk to us and we'll find one that's maybe not so stinky. So I tend to do 50-50 leaf mold and uh, fungal. Um, that way I'm kind of getting the best of both worlds. I'm getting my bacterial microorganisms that are going to help break down the more dead organic material. And then I've got my fungal uh, supporting micro uh, biome that I'm adding with the fungal compost. Um, I think having a balance is really, really important. Um, you can't have all bacteria Otherwise, it's really just not gonna do what you're expecting it to do because it does need that fungal to help break things down. Bacteria and fungi just break things down differently. Um, and so I don't think you're gonna get quite as much impact with a straight leaf mold or a straight fungal. Um, so I really do like to mix them up. Um, this, so we've got a handful of compost here at the store. Um, this is an organic compost. It's really pretty simple. It does have a little bit of manure in it, but not much. Um, I use that for a long time. Super happy with it. It's not doing anything but good things. We just got this, um, the ground up compost in. I am so excited to try it. <laughs> um, it is a fungal manure compost. So I'm super excited. Um, any of these, they don't smell, I mean, they smell earthy. They smell like you would expect compost to smell like, but it's not something that's overwhelming. Um, so I'm probably about to make the switch to, to this ground up. Um, and then over here, we have a couple of more amendment things. Um, Fox Farm, that's, they do Happy Frog, they do Ocean Forest, very familiar soil line. They have this soil conditioner. Not truly a compost it's just going to kind of activate what's already in your soil and maybe a little locked up it's not adding anything to the micro uh, microbiome that's happening down there it's just kind of activating what's already there great for a refresher if i had a bed that maybe i hadn't amended in a year or so this is a really good option for me to add some more just to wake up everything that's already there if it's a bed that I've never done anything with, I am going straight to compost um, because I want to add to it instead of just wake up what may or may not be there. Um, the other alternative is this raised bed mix. All of my outside plants are planted in this stuff that's not like in the ground. Um, it is a potting soil, however, it has a really high compost content. So I find when I'm using this, I don't have to add additional compost to it. I can literally just dump it out of the bag, plant, call it done. So there are varying um, 
degrees of work that you may have to do. Um, I am a lazy gardener. I will admit it freely. I do as little as I can to get the results I want. Any of these products are going to help me get there and it's going to make it easier for me. I'm going to have to do less work because I'm choosing good products to start with and they're doing my work for me. Um, so any of these, go home with them. They're amazing. You will love them. Um, but that's kind of how that works. The other thing, so we were talking about the soil conditioner. We also have a liquid form. It's called soil activator. It's going to act in the same way. It's not necessarily adding any microbiome to the established bed, pot, whatever, um, but it will activate what may already be there. So we've activated everything. We've added a bunch of microorganisms to our soil to make it nice and healthy. Those guys are hungry. Um, I never use a product, especially the soil activator or the soil conditioner, without following up with a feeding. So horticultural molasses is what is going to feed that microbiome. Um, again, if I'm adding compost, I'm not super worried about it. They have plenty to eat in that compost. But if I'm just kind of activating what's already there, I don't want to wake something up and then not give it something to eat. I think that's fair. Um, you know, they're not going to really stick around if there aren't resources. They're going to go find another place that has the resources that they need to survive. So I want them there. So I'm going to provide all those resources for them. That comes in the way of horticultural molasses. Um, because a lot of these guys, what they are actually doing, they are taking the organic material and breaking it down to um, complex sugars. Molasses. That's what you got. Just the complex sugars that they're making are not something that I would ever put in cookies or anything. Um, don't use this to bake with. Uh, just use it to feed your little microorganisms in your soils. Um, but that's always, again, I don't want to be woken up and left hungry. I just assume my little bugs don't either. And I do love bugs. Okay, so benefits of compost. Again, this was the hardest slide for me to make because I started with a list of like 75 different ways that compost can help. Um, biggest thing is it's going to improve the structural and nutritional health of the soil. You know, we've kind of touched on that. It's adding um, that those microorganisms to help break everything down, which in turn is breaking down all the nutrients that need to be available for those, so those plant roots to remain healthy and produce growth and make you happy um, or provide you food or whatever you enjoy about plants. That's what it's going to do. Um, it's also going to be attracting those beneficial macro and micronutrients. The more beneficial organisms you have, the healthier the plant is and the less likely for an infestation of something that may be plant damaging or soil damaging. And that's kind of true across the board. So if you're having a really stressed out plant, um, that plant in itself is going to be more susceptible to insect infestations. It's going to be more susceptible to disease. Um, so if I'm starting from the ground up and making my soil really healthy, that's going to make my plant really healthy. That is in turn going to prevent a lot of the things that kind of happen in the garden. Um, again, I'm lazy. I'm letting all of this stuff do my work for me. Um, I also don't want to put a bunch of pesticides out there. Um, again, I really like insects. Even the non-beneficial ones, total human term, um, but the plant damaging insects, you know, they have a place in the ecosystem as well. So I'm going to let my beneficials battle my non-beneficials and I'm going to step away and hopefully the beneficials win. Gotcha. Okay, so um, soil structure. So these are kind of the building blocks of soil structure. Um, these are more uh, like earth materials, rocks that are broken down into smaller or larger pieces. So we've got our granular, which would be more like sand. Um, we've got our blocky, which would be more like pebbles or such. Um, our platy. <laughs> 
that's a weird term. Those are the ones they can either look column, like a column, or they can be really flat, kind of easily breakable pieces of rock. Um, you see them kind of come off in a flat, if you've ever like gone rock hunting. Do it next time you're walking around, I bet you're gonna find a bunch of these all over the place. We've got our massive, which again are like massive boulders and stuff, and then our single grain, which is going to be even finer than sand. Um, so these are kind of the building blocks for soil. These get broken down for through erosion. They get broken down from water and eons and eons of just earth movement. So without organic material, these really don't do much. So when we're talking about improving the soil structure, I'm talking about taking these building blocks of soil and then adding broken down organic material in it to make it nutritional and stay in the same place. So it's going to, does that, does that help? Okay. <laughs> Good. So um, essentially, you know, this doesn't have a lot of value as, as far as when we're talking plants. Um, so, you know, if you're dealing with kind of a, a spot that is really just kind of broken down building blocks, adding that compost to it is going to actually provide the soil that will in turn make the structure. Yeah. Does that help? That helps. Okay, okay. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I'm very glad to hear that. Um, again, this is a really complicated topic. You know, this is something that people go to school to study for years and years and years you know, we're breaking it down into an hour class. Uh, so I encourage all of you to do some learning. Like it is, it's a lot of fun. Total wormhole. So make sure you have the time to do it because you will go down, yeah, total wormhole. Uh, but that's essentially how soil structure is formed. Um, it's also going to help to retain the moisture. So once we've added all of that organic, uh, material to it that's going to help retain moisture. It's also going to act as an insulator both in the heat It's going to insulate from the heat It's going to keep those roots a little bit cooler and in the winter. It's going to keep those roots a little bit warmer um, Similar to how mulch works mulch is just kind of an additional uh, moisture retaining uh, insulator compost is where it all starts um, I know y'all can't really see this, but this is really interesting. So this breaks down the soil microbiome into the different kinds of uh, uh, microorganisms that you might find. Um, I found this really interesting. Bunch of scientific names that are always fun to say. Um, but this is a chart that I kind of readily found on uh, Google. I wanted to see where is my favorite chart for kind of how this system works. This is very specific to a manure compost. We can see we have the cow. Um, we are going to take its manure and add it to other things and make a wonderful compost for it. Um, so these microorganisms are pretty specific to a manure based compost, um, but all of these guys will be found in every single compost, maybe just in different ratios. And then over here, we can see some soil erosion. Um, this is where we go back to soil structure. Um, if we only have these building blocks, we don't have anything really tying the roots into the building blocks, we're gonna lose a lot. Um, we see this commonly on creek beds. Um, there are a million factors that go into this, to, to soil erosion in general. Um, but one of those factors is poor soil structure. There's just not enough soil to really hold all of those building blocks in place. Does that, you kind of look like you have a question. You can ask one. Oh, no. Okay, gotcha, okay. <laughs> um, so again, we're trying to start off with a really good foundation. Um, I hate seeing the soil erosion. It's really interesting. So which is the park in California? Is that Yellowstone? I get Yellowstone and Yosemite mixed up. Either one. So the one in California, um, they were having huge soil erosion problems. 
Um, come to find out it was because deer were eating the plants before they could ever get an established root system because all of their predators had been removed from the area. The moment they <laughs> released wolves back into that ecosystem, I mean, within weeks, they started seeing saplings that were actually able to get to a developmental point where they were acting as they were holding all that soil in. They saw improvement in their riverbanks immediately. Again, that's just one factor, totally off topic because I can't not bring wildlife into every conversation I ever have. Um, but that's a big thing. So they may have had some depleted you know, soil. They had all the blocks. They had some depleted soil and then nothing was ever given a chance to really hold all that soil together. So it's really interesting how how all of this can kind of fit together. It's one of my favorite reintroduction of predator stories. <laughs> okay, okay. So you want to compost at home? Again, best compost you will ever have. Um, it takes effort. Um, it takes time. It takes patience. It takes a little bit of manual labor to make it happen. <coughs> Not to be said that it can't be done. If you are willing to put in the effort, it is worth it in rewards. Um, so composting bins, I think, are honestly the easiest. So we've got a couple set up over here. Um, I can see just with this one, so I would set this wherever I wanted it in my yard, same thing with that guy. Um, I would then start filling it with different compostable ma materials. Um, we can see that we've got plenty of vents all around because in order to compost, we need oxygen, we need moisture, and to a, a certain extent, heat. Um, having a container like this is going to help keep it warmer than it might normally be if it was just in a pile. Um, the reason I like these so much is it has these little panels that you can take off and like shove a pitchfork or a shovel or something in there and get it mixed up. Um, these have worked really well for me in the past. Granted, I, again, I'm lazy, so I stopped doing it. continue to break down I'm probably going to add a little bit more because that a little bit more raw materials because that middle section is going to be a little more broke down but I'm still going to need to build it up this final bin is for the final product everything has been broken down I am ready to spread that in my garden again super fun pitchforks work great any excuse to use a pitchfork is always you know always a fun thing um, so you can easily do that my biggest tip on if you are going to build one, make sure you're, you're, you are using cedar wood um, or some kind of untreated, long-lasting wood. Especially if you're gonna be using this stuff on veggies or something that you're gonna eat, you wanna make sure that you're not putting, in it, unintentionally putting harmful chemicals into your compost pile. So if you're building something out of wood, just make sure it's untreated. Cedar is the kind of industry standard for building outside raised beds otherwise, um, just because it lasts so long um, and you don't have to treat it. You don't have to seal it. Um, so if you are gonna be doing a DIY system, just make sure you're choosing high quality wood that doesn't have, that hasn't been treated with anything. Um, and if you really just want to go for it and you have the space, start a pile in the corner of your yard. I mean, it really can be that simple. I'm going to dedicate this corner to my compost pile. I might go and turn it every so often. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep adding to it and I'm going to let it kind of degrade and decompose on its own. Um, if I had more room, that is probably the method that I would go with because again, it's the easiest um, and it's just easy. One thing I can tell you about composting at home, um, 
choosing a location is really important. I would put it as kind of as far away from my house as you can. Once you put food outside, regardless of how fresh it is, you no longer get to control who eats it. So if you have a large wildlife presence in your neighborhood, just keep that in mind. Um, you are probably going to attract some critters. Um, again, if it's far enough away from the house, wildlife really isn't going to put themselves in unnecessary danger. They're gonna go to the closest, safest spot to find those resources. If that's the compost pile in the corner of your yard and they have everything they need, they're probably not gonna come up to your house. Um, however, putting a pile of food outside will probably attract something. So just be aware of that. Um, it's still totally doable. This is where the patience comes in. <laughs> and if you're doing a DIY one like this, you could always just add a lid, um, something that would contain it. You do need ventilation, so if you're doing like chicken wire or something like this, keep in mind little raccoons can stick their hands through just about anything. They can also figure out any kind of trap that you have ever set for them. Um, so I would not put it past a raccoon to be able to open the lid of something like this. I find that if I'm prepared, it's not gonna be so shocking when it happens. Um, I'm gonna have a better uh, response than I might if I was not expecting it. So, fair warning, you'll probably get some critters. Put up a trail cam, they're adorable. Um, and enjoy it. Okay. So what can you compost? Um, so, oh, I'm so sorry, this is really fuzzy. Um, the city of Austin, a few years ago, did start compost bins in certain neighborhoods. Um, if you have that available, this will help you reduce your landfill trash significantly. Um, they just implemented it in my neighborhood about a year ago. We don't even have to take our trash can out once a week. Like it has almost eliminated landfill trash for my household. Um, take advantage of that. Almost everything can go into it, food scraps, um, yard trimmings, natural fibers, so cotton shirts. Um, when I'm sweeping my house, all of the dog hair, all of that goes into it. Like I literally, there is very little in our trash can. Um, and it was an immediate difference. I mean, absolutely immediate. The first week we started using it, we had almost no trash. Um, you can do eggshells, you can do like wood and toothpicks and stuff, as long as they're not sealed. Um, paper, so this is now like my compost bin is where all of my shredded paper goes now. Um, you're gonna wanna kind of avoid shiny coated paper. Not that it's dangerous per se, it's just gonna take a really long time to break down because it has kind of that shiny surface that's just gonna repel um, moisture um, to help it break down a little bit faster. But if you have like newspaper, you can put that in there. Cardboard, you can put that in there. I always peel the tape off of it just to make sure that I'm not putting anything plasticky. Um, but the options are kind of endless. So I strongly encourage if you have that available, just get in the habit of using it. I keep a little bucket under my sink. So as I accumulate food scraps, I just kind of add them to that and then I take it out when it's ready. Um, but I was really shocked to see the difference that it made in my own household. Um, so if you have that, please do it. Um, if you don't, explore maybe composting another way at home. Again, the bins are the most contained version of an at-home uh, composter that you can find. Pile is not super contained. Um, and if you were to make kind of a series of bins, you could contain that, but I, I do find that this is the most contained. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. And I guess I just want to know, um, are they really composting? Probably. Um, so there's a lot of, and 
not getting into the reasons or theoretical reasons, uh, but we've seen a lot in our world kind of make that shift to the biodegradable, compostable uh, market, which, great. Um, I'm really glad for that. Um, as long as they're not coated with anything, I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, like regular paper bags can easily go in there. Um, that might even be a way, like if you have paper grocery bags at home, you could just not get the compostable ones and just use paper bags. Um, but I would, I would believe it before I wouldn't. Okay. Does that kind of make, oh, sorry. Um, does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Um, so we do have a lot of stuff that, um, sorry y'all, I just hit the button with my elbow. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's available to purchase now that I feel confident putting into a compost pile that I may potentially be eating from. You know what I mean? Um, and if that helps you compost then by all means do it like yeah yeah I wouldn't I wouldn't not trust it right off the bat if you were worried you can always do a little more research um, but as long as it's not sealed as long as it's a natural fiber you should be good to go yeah I wouldn't worry about it too much um, yes Yeah, so uh, you can, and it's on the city's website, um, there are pickup places throughout town where you can go pick up mulch, you can go pick up compost. Um, I would go through them directly just to make sure, because they are like distribution centers, I guess is what they would be called, um, but they do make that available to residents um, after it's composted, yeah, yeah. Sure, so that you can use it? Absolutely, absolutely. Sure. We don't. Um, so I think the way around, like how much space are you talking about working with? Not a lot, okay. I mean, you could try making like a smaller version of the DIY one where it's just narrow, um, you know, little bins. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And does it uh, does it break it down pretty quickly? Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Have you checked it lately? So I can't stop. I I check on everything. Has it? Does it look like it's working? Cool. You don't really have to do anything. You just like put the stuff in it and make it available and it'll do it on its own. Cool, cool. It has a lot of small Yeah, like maybe search apartment composting, something like that, like small space composting. Um, if you do it outside, just keep in mind critters. <laughs> so now this is bottom this doesn't have a bottom so what i've done in the past is there are little slots here i just take tent stakes and just stake it directly into the ground not going to be a hundred percent animal proof but it's going to make it harder which is most likely going to make them find an easier meal does that make sense? Wildlife really isn't going to do, they're not gonna go further than they need to go. Um, and they're not gonna waste a lot of time if it's a potentially dangerous situation, which their whole world is a potentially dangerous situation. So I have staked these down with just old tent stakes before and that's worked just fine. Um, so that might be an option as well. But these are bottomless, I mean, intentionally. Um, we wouldn't really want to seal it because we do want to be able to turn it really well. And as it uh, decomposes, it's also going to start going into the soil right under it. So like with these, once I've got a batch that's fully composted, I'm ready to spread it, I'm gonna use all of it, I'll probably take this compost bin and move it 
even just right next to the spot that it was in because the soil that this is actually sitting on has now been revitalized with the compost as it's physically breaking down. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's like a million small space options for composting things. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Just hose it off every once in a while. Um, so there is a such a thing as being too wet. Um, so soldier flies, I'm sure all of y'all have seen them, just didn't know what they were. There are these, they look like wasps, except they're, pi they're pitch black, shiny, almost like iridescent black. Um, they prefer, they're absolutely harmless they do nothing but help they break down a lot of organic material themselves their larval stage um, which are maggots uh, <laughs> so but if you're seeing a lot of the black soldier flies around that means that it's probably too wet and I would kind of cut back a little bit um, but it does need some moisture um, that's going to help the organisms that are in there because just like us, they need water, they need food, and they need shelter um, to do their jobs. Um, so it doesn't have to be soaking wet, but moisture does have to be present. And you said that it heats as well. Does that mean you can't? It pretty much does it. So it kind of heats itself. Um, as, so as things decompose, it generates a tremendous amount of heat just naturally because we have all of these um, microscopic activities happening that just per physics expends a, a tremendous amount of heat. So as long as it's contained, it's going to retain a lot of, it's going to retain enough heat to get the job done. You don't have to apply additional heat to it unless you are taking raw manure and trying to compost it, which honestly, I've never talked to anybody who wasn't part of a ranch or some kind of farm that was actually taking raw manure and turning it into something that, that they would spread on their vegetable garden. Um, so the heat kind of happens on its own. Yeah, um, I had a tree stump that I'd been trying to get out of the way for years and years and years and I walked outside one day and there was a little spiral of what I thought smoke coming up from the middle like this teeny tiny hole panicked stuck the hose down it which just made the steam worse called the fire department they came out and they broke it up with their axes it was composting it generated so much heat that the steam of that heat actually started to escape from this teeny tiny hole on the top. Freaked me out. Like I have never had to call the fire department before. Me adding the hose to it just made it worse because it was hot. So the steam just like, it, it was definitely an experience, um, but that was only under a tree stump. I mean, it generated enough heat that it started streaming or like steaming up out of the hole. So just the activity of decompositions creates enough heat for things to decompose and compost. Yeah, it's amazing. How do you know when it's ready to be put in your garden? So it's going to look almost like soil. Um, it's going to be, and depending on what you're using, a lot of times the leaf mold compost do retain more shape than like a fungal compost, just because that, again, that's the dead organic material. So it's gonna break down much slower. Um, you shouldn't be able to see any raw ingredients. So you shouldn't be able to see banana peels or, you know, you shouldn't be able to identify anything as something you've put into it. Um, again, that can take a long time depending on lots of factors. That depends on what our ambient temperature is, if it's in full sun, if it's in shade, how much water you're getting it, how, how often you're turning it. The more often you turn it and agitate it, the faster things are gonna break down. Um, just, not necessarily so there is a tipping point there's a point where you add so much raw material that without kind of constant agitation it's really gonna just sit there for a really long time the inside like the central inside bottom is probably gonna start doing stuff on its own but by the time you get 
to where you're seeing some progress. Not that it's too late, but it would be much easier with a smaller pile that you can freely turn and add water and oxygen to. Um, and you then you have kind of a constant supply, like that three bin um, DIY system. Um, you know, as it progresses through those bins, you just start over with the first one. So by the time you're ready to use your first round of compost that you've made, you've already got the second round started. Um, and that's gonna happer, happen faster with a smaller volume. But yeah, so to know when it's ready, it should really look like a soil or a soil amendment. You shouldn't be able to identify anything that you've actually added to it. Um, but again, that can take, be patient. It will happen. <laughs> um, as far as quickness goes, yeah. or what seed scraps make the best compost? A variety, a balanced. I mean, and that might encourage us to. I know that encourages me to eat a little more balanced too. Um, because every food is going to bring its own set of nutrients to the table, um, to the compost table. Um, so, uh, you know, coffee grounds are going to add one thing, banana peels are going to add another, orange rinds are going to add something else. Um, but if, bless you, if you've got a nice diversity of items in there, it's going to be a really healthy compost. And a lot of times, different things will help other things break down faster. Um, citric acid, you know, squeeze some lemon juice on it or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, similar to that. So, um, do you need a balance of both the seed scraps and the yard stuff? I always do, yeah. And again, it all comes down to balance. So, the food scraps are going to help the yard trimmings break down faster. The yard trimmings are going to help the food scraps bake, break down faster. Um, if you were to just do nothing but food scraps, um, that's going to get real stinky um, and it's probably going to take a really long time to break down. Whereas if you're adding some leaves or grass clippings, I throw dandelions in mine and I've never had a dandelion come up. Um, that's going to break down at a different rate, which is in turn going to attract different uh, bacteria and fungi that are going to then go to those food scraps to help start breaking them down too. It's all about just as diverse as you can get it, as much different material as you can get in there is, is going to be the most helpful. Sure, yeah. Sure. I can guarantee you, if you have someone on your block that has a bunch of trees, if you just went over and said, hey, I need some yard trimmings, they would be like, go for it. Yeah. You can come to my house anytime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that might be a really fun community you know, project. Like if there's a shared space in a neighborhood, you know, instead of maybe a community garden, maybe a community compost pile for folks that do, you know, independently garden. Um, maybe one of your neighbors has a bigger yard and is interested to maybe partner with you. Um, you know, it could be a fun community project. Uh, I know a lot of schools are starting to implement a lot of this stuff into their curriculum. So kids are learning about composting really early. Um, yeah, I would, I would say start talking. Yeah, if anybody has a bunch of trees, I say just walk up and I have some trimming. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So these guys have evolved to withstand the heat of composting. Short of being actively on fire, <laughs> it's probably going to be OK. Um, if anything, I would protect it from the really hot afternoon sun in the summer 
Right now it can have sun all day long, but if you've got it in a south or a west part of your yard where it's gonna get those hours of just blazing hot, hot afternoon sun, like four or 5 p.m. after, um, maybe move it just a little bit over so it gets some shade during those, air, those times of the day um, because it's creating its own source of heat adding heat to it. I've never heard of a compost pile catching on fire. Um, I'm sure it can happen, um, but I've never personally experienced an interaction with somebody where it did. I mean, I thought my tree stump was on fire. <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't. Um, but so I would, I would probably try to get it just a little bit out of that hot afternoon sun, um, but where it gets enough sun throughout the day yeah. to, to help. I was just thinking about like, because I mean, isn't like a big portion of composting like the actual pile? Absolutely. Like, really? Yeah, I would, I would make those fires. Yeah, no, I mean, they would have to kind of be set on fire. <laughs> you know, these guys really have developed and evolved to withstand the very specific, um, I guess microclimate that a compost pile would would create. Um, I've never worried about it getting too hot. I can tell you my stump had like hundreds of roaches living in it as it was steaming. Roaches, okay, they're doing a job. They're the one insect that, I love insects, but they are the one insect I will run away from. And I don't know why, it's this weird thing with my brain, I, d I don't know why. But there were, when the firemen started breaking up the stump, like poured out of it. So it was to a point where it was so hot it was steaming and there was still plenty of insect life in there. So I wouldn't worry too much. Yeah, 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 I wouldn't worry too much. But yeah, if you, if you give it some of that hot afternoon summer protection, um, it'll probably be appreciative. Yeah. Probably, yeah. yeah. I mean, again, it kind of goes back to that. Once you put a food source outside, you you kind of oh, totally, yeah. I there's not a lot small wise that it's not going to be able to get in here. But again, roaches are doing a really good job at what they do. They are there to break things down. Um, so I would, from a distance, happily see roaches like I'd be happy to see roaches in my compost pile because I know that they are yeah as long as they don't come after me I'm fine uh, but they are doing a job they are helping with that decomposition into compost yeah so um, we have the worms that we carry uh, they're gonna be the red wigglers um, these guys are the smaller ones, so they're not going to be the super giant earthworms that you like fish with or anything. These guys are going to be, I don't know if anybody, so these guys are kind of tiny. These are essentially composting worms. They're going to live in the um, kind of top foot or so of soil or of your compost pile, whatever, um, and it's going to start breaking things down from the top down versus the bottom down. Um, so when you're looking for compost worms specifically, you're going to want to go with the smaller red wigglers, not the great big giant earthworms. Those are lower soil level worms. So those are the ones that you're going to find when you're digging a hole versus in that top um, top layer of, of substrate yeah but yeah I'm if you're digging and you're seeing worms you've already got a good system um, they wouldn't be there if there wasn't if it wasn't conducive for them to be there I never wear gloves. <laughs> That's not that it's a good thing. Um, it's just I don't really think about it until I'm already elbow deep in something. And then I think maybe I should have put on gloves. Um, I've never worn gloves to handle compost. I make sure that I wash my hands afterwards. Um, even the manure compost, I think I've dumped and spread out. 
wear gloves though. Please, if you, you know, um, that is a very good point. And I forget that gloves exist because I don't think about using them. Um, pardon? Totally, I lose a little bit of dexterity, so I can't really tell what I'm doing so good. Um, and I like the way dirt feels on my, in my hands. I can't help it. It's just, it feels good, you know? Um, so this new compost that we just got, we opened a bag just so that we could kind of get a feel, literally get a feel for it. It felt so good, y'all. Um, <laughs> like, it felt really good. It's a little bit finer. The organic compost is a little bit chunkier, so it's going to add um, a little bit more volume than uh, the My Organic Compost, the ground up stuff. Um, either way, they're going to do amazing jobs, but this stuff felt great on my hands. I washed them afterwards <laughs> before I ate or drank anything, uh, but it really did feel good. So. And that's really satisfying. <laughs> um, so, coffee grounds. Yes. So you, Starbucks, do you put them um, directly on your plants or do you put them in a compost? I would put them in compost. Um, yeah. Or mix them in with soil. I try to avoid putting any concentrated amendment directly on plants. I'm gonna mix it with something, whether I'm mixing it into a compost that's going to further break down, or if I'm just mixing it in with like potting soil or something. Um, just in case, just in case there's something concentrated in there that maybe I don't want that concentration of and may potentially harm my plants. Coffee grounds I'm not overly worried about. They have little chance of burning or doing a lot of damage I feel better and it makes it more uniform like it's gonna do it's gonna be a little more efficient if it's distributed thoroughly throughout a planting medium versus just kind of poured on top does that kind of make sense okay um, manure definitely do not ever apply raw manure straight to your plants it will burn them um, again if you're looking for a manure compost look for something that's pre-composted. You don't want that raw manure. You want the manure that has been raised to the appropriate heat to kill off any potentially harmful uh, bacteria, parasites otherwise. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, I, anytime I'm adding anything, I'm going to try to get it as evenly dis you know, distributed throughout whatever I'm adding it to more for efficiency's sake. Um, that way I don't have this pocket of something that's really high, and then I'm kind of void of it over in this area. Um, and it gives me another chance to get my hands on the dirt. So. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Do y'all feel like you've learned? You can go out and make your own compost. Fantastic. Um, so let's, let me just make sure, since I hit it with my elbow earlier, okay, that is it. Yeah, so if y'all don't have any other questions, um, I have some coupons for everybody. Um, do not hesitate to ask anybody on the floor anything. Um, we are all here to help and talk about plants, because just shut us up <laughs> and these grow green guides are for all of y'all um, if you have one at home you're already a step ahead um, if you don't it is a great planning guide um, everything in here is going to be native and adapted which means you're automatically going to have less problems with them because they have evolved in our system granted our climate is changing drastically so these may be adjusted sooner than we think, um, but for right now, they're still pretty apt. Thank you. you are welcome. Well, thank y'all so much. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Um, you got one? You got everyone got their coupon? Fantastic. Absolutely. Thank y'all so much for coming. Um, this is for y'all. Like, we enjoy doing these classes so much and if y'all were not attending them we wouldn't be able to do them so thank y'all so much for being here um go plant some stuff
<laughs> Y'all have a wonderful day. Absolutely.